Sports has a long history of being the first place that creates social change, especially when it involves black Americans. Jesse Owens dominating the Olympics in Germany in front of Hitler, Jackie Robinson being the first player in Major League Baseball at the 1968 Olympics, gold medalist Tommy Smith, John Carlos, and uh, raising their fists in protest for black power, um, and also Peter Norman of Australia in third place, um, honoring them as well. And then, of course, Gabby Douglas. That's all we need to say. This is episode 427 for June 3rd, 2020. Uh, this would have been the first week of U.S. Nationals, um, but we are in the midst of something, in my opinion, that's much more important, and it is another wave of um, the civil rights, continuation of the civil rights movement, and Black Lives, Ma Black Lives Matter, and um, we are in the sixth day, seventh day of protests around the world. Um, and so I want to introduce you to um, Alexis Brown, who is a UC Davis gymnast, um, and she's a program record holder, and she knelt during the national anthem um, during the 2017 NCAA season. Alexis, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you for everything you've done for this movement. Um, it's been a couple years since you started kneeling. Um, what are your general feelings about uh, kneeling now? It's been a couple of years. Um, what is the status? What's changed? So I think that in the 2017 and 2018 seasons, people were very confused over what the symbol actually meant. Um, they were easily condemning kneeling in the national anthem as a symbol of disrespect to um, our military. And although, you know, I, Colin Kaepernick, um, many others have tried to explain that that's not actually the message, it was per perceived as falling on deaf ears. So I think that now, as more people become educated in the athlete community as well as the world, that kneeling, what kneeling actually means, um, it's getting taken more seriously. And I don't, I mean, I don't hear people making those same ignorant claims as before. So I'm happy with it. <laughs> and tell us what it means to you. Right, go ahead, Spencer. No, you. that is a good question. Okay. I'd like to hear as well. <laughs> so kneeling really for me meant to show people before, you know, before the gymnastics all started, before any sports actually started, um, kind of that like, you have to notice me. You have to notice exactly what I am saying to you. It's a, it's a plea for help, honestly, that like, it's not just about this sport anymore. We're on a larger stage. We have to use our voices to speak for those that are getting murdered. This is not a political statement. This is a statement about human rights. And how do I phrase this? <laughs> Um, I think that back then and now I can say that although I never wanted to disrespect the American flag, it is disheartening that the country that I'm supposed to stand up for will not stand up for me and my body. I think like one of the things that Trevor Noah pointed out really well this week was how the social contract has been broken. And part of that kneeling is showing like, we're supposed to follow the rules. We agreed to this. And the rules are like, you're supposed to protect us as the police and not murder us. Like we're supposed to have due process and the social contract's broken. And that's why people are now, that's why we see the demonstrations that we see all over the world is because the rules don't apply anymore because you've broken them. And now there's so much evidence because we now have a video evidence. So what people have been saying for hundreds of years literally um now there's you know you can watch a video and see what's happening so yeah. spencer did you felt like you left the experience of kneeling during the 2017 and 2018 season more on the side of like hopeful that maybe some people heard your message or more on the side of like oh people just don't get this i think that it was a mix of both because in the gymnastics community i did not feel heard at all, unfortunately. Um, I felt really dis disheartened. I felt attacked 
it was not just the silence of my teammates and my coaches, um, my teammates' parents that really hurt me. It was people that were actively trying to antagonize me and discredit the movement that I was trying to stand up for. But with that being said, I think that I also felt so much more hope because I had people coming out of the woodworks at my school um, through all other um, all other sports, all other, you know, we had the cross-cultural center, we had the African diaspora center reaching out to me and saying, we see you, we hear you, we stand with you, how can we do better? And that for me was like, okay, I have someone's attention. These people have, you know, the avenues to really make greater change than I can do right now within my own community. So it gave me hope for the future. And so on the topic of gymnastics reaction specifically, I was wondering if you had thoughts on the many and the lack of comments from many NCAA programs about to make any statement about that Black Lives Matter um, and how they've kind of had to be pressured into it over the course of days. So I would like to, you know, remain neutral about it. But at this point in time, there's no room for neutral. There's no room to save people's, um, you know, to be nice about things anymore because nice did not work. I think it's cowardice. Um, I think that their silence is showing them that they are on the side of the oppressor and it's no longer okay. And you'll see that from many other athletes. It's not just me. I mean, a current UCD gymnast reached out to me and said that they don't feel comfortable coming back to the sport of gymnastics after all this is done because their coach is silent and they see other people um, in the community staying silent. And then under the USAG post saying that they were um, in, in, um, in support of Black Lives Matter, the comments were crazy. There were also beautiful comments and supportive comments but at least half of them were disgusting. And um, that's, we're gonna talk, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't wanna interrupt you, go ahead. Um, just also like Kennedy Baker really reached out um, and posted a tweet saying that she thought that it was very on brand for coaches and other programs to remain silent, just as they were asked her to remain silent when they made racist comments to her. But you don't hear these things you know, in the mainstream media of our community, because everyone's asking them to silence their black voices. To me, I mean, one of the things we're going to talk about is what schools have spoken out and who hasn't. And like, to me, it's obviously like important that you have to like talk to your actual team, but it's also important to publicly make a statement. And to me, we were talking about this before you came on, like retweeting something from your athletic director is not the same as the coach the head of the program who sets the culture making a personal statement like that's that is a huge difference do you feel like you that's what you want to call on the head coaches of these programs to do exactly you know i think that reposting what your school your school's stance is um a great thing to do in addition to making your own statement because it's too easy to just go along with what you should be doing um, in this situation instead of actually really reflecting on what you've done wrong and what you can do better and telling your community that how you feel about it because it's not personalized enough it's not genuine enough if you just repost something that your you know your athletic director has said just because you don't want to make them angry one of the um, things that I was really happy to see that happened this week is that um, the Ohio State program um, called on, um, call me Effie is his um, his Twitter, but remember, um, oh my God, I'm totally blanking on his name. I have it in the notes. Um, so he's an Ohio State gymnast and he was really outspoken, much like Kennedy Baker was about his experience on the team. And uh, he's really angry as he should be. And um, the team had a meeting this uh today or yesterday where they called on an alumni and him and they sat down with the team including the team captain and they had a talk and he was able to share his experience as well as um the alumni and that is like to me a huge sign of hope um that people are not just burying that like we can't have bad press for our program 
um, that they're having a meeting and having this experience and let people share their feelings. And like, you're supposed to learn. This is what college is about, right? Did you have support like that when you were in the program? Was there an opportunity to sit down with the whole team and explain like something formal? So there was one opportunity to sit and explain, but it was after months of my teammates not speaking to me um, because of my protests and because I called out people for the racist claims that they have made. And in that meeting, I was met with a lot of resistance, so much resistance that it was exhausting. And I told them right then and there, like, if they're not ready to hear my, if they're not ready to hear me, then I can't waste my time doing this alone. As the only black gymnast on this team, the only black person in the entire room, I can't be the only one to speak for all black people. I can't educate you in our 20 minute team meeting. But if you're willing to listen to me every single day, when I, you know, confront you about what you've said that is wrong or you know, how you can do better. Oh, thank you for saying that. It actually really, you know, inspires me. That would be different. But I would have loved to have the alumni come back um, and tell me about their lived experiences as well and really inspire people in that moment and have a larger group discussion. I just don't think that it necessarily worked for me because I was the only person of color in that room. How do you feel... I mean, we saw Isis um, from Oregon State. She's an Australian gymnast tweet about this a lot as she was like kind of shocked coming to a country where we're supposed to be able to speak out. And that's one of the things we pride ourselves on. And then once you get into an NCA program, you're monitored and you're a you're a marketing pawn and um, you can't just say whatever you feel like. Um how did you feel like your, did you feel like you were able to make this decision on your own? Or did you feel like you had to go through an approval process before you could do it because you're on an NCAA team? I think that it's important to know, to denote the distinguish, like to distinguish between the difference of um, speaking out on, you know, how you just feel day to day um, about things that may or may not be relevant to, you know, the current state of the world versus speaking out on human rights. Um, because I know a lot of people do feel like they should be able to speak out about whatever they want. And some of those things might be very hurtful um, and non-productive and that I don't really stand with. But when it comes to human rights and what I was trying to stand for, I think I should have been able to, you know, go out there and not have constant meetings with my athletic director asking me to stop. I didn't jump through hoops because I didn't tell anyone that I was going to do it. I just went and I did it. And that might have been wrong um, just because the shock that everyone felt was um, overwhelming, but I don't regret it because after that I had to expend so much more energy having to explain to the people higher up in our program that I wasn't going to stop. No matter how much they told me that I had to, that I wasn't going to, do, I wasn't going to get the same opportunities, that they were, I was making them look bad. I wasn't going to stop. You're a record holder for the UC Davis program. Yeah. Congratulations on that. <laughs> um, a lot of times, feel people feel like I mean, we see this a lot with Simone. People feel like they don't have power to speak out, especially in the minority community. Um, until they can't be ignored because of what they add to a program. I mean, we saw that totally backfire with Kaepernick, although I feel like everything he did totally worked, but he lost his job and can't get hired back now. And the NFL statement this week was just complete, like, hypocrisy, ironic crap. Um, <laughs> saying they stand with Black Lives Matter and this guy can't get a job. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, did you feel like you couldn't make that statement and take this risk until you had proven that they can't couldn't take you off the team I really thought about that for a long time like if I wasn't good enough for people to if I wasn't good enough in the sport of gymnastics would people still see my protest and think that it was valid um and honestly I'm, I'm not really sure if I wasn't constantly winning if people would actually take notice um 
you know, not to say that I'm any Simone Biles in any way, uh, but like in the competitions that we were doing that were against, you know, teams that were very level matched, um, you know, I was getting first place constantly. And when I'd put my fist in the air, people would, were like, whoa, why is she doing that? What, what's happening? You know, versus not being able to do, not being able to stand up as first place and really make a statement. Um, I, it's just so hard though, because once you, you know, start doing so great in your sport, you don't want someone to take that away from you just because of the statement that you're trying to make. But you also feel guilty for not using your platform that you've worked so hard for, you know, in light of something that you really believe in. Yeah. Um, there is, God, that speaks so much to like, I feel like what so many of the survivors have gone through. And like, one of the things that we talked about this week is I was kind of like, it shouldn't, like, I felt like at first we shouldn't have, we shouldn't have to have, um, we as white people who host this show, we're the, it's our privilege. We benefit from this system, even if we're not a part of it. And we shouldn't have to have someone on the show who has experienced this and they have to speak out in order to explain it. And I felt like that was comparing it to the survivors. Like it's the job of the system to protect the survivors. Um, why do we always have to have someone who's been victimized come forward and speak out? Um, and I think that comparison, like, but then also this like whole day, like we're recording on Tuesday, this whole day is about listening, right? To so this is Tuesday, the blackout day, and it's about listening and it's about learning and it's about letting people speak so we can learn from that experience. And um, I, I just want to mention that because I and like this next question. Um, I feel like it's one of the things that's really spoken to me this last week has been that like, it's not enough not to be racist um, that coming up. And I feel like that's so, so, so important. And I feel like um, one of the things that has been people have been reminded of is how after MLK was assassinated, there were riots everywhere. Like there are now as there should be because the social contract once again, broken um and then the civil rights act was finally passed um six days later like oh look you know and it's like if if you're not being heard you have to do things that'll make you heard that'll change um so considering that not being racist is not enough we have to do something and especially we white people whether you think you're racist or not or you think that you're anti-racist um what do we need to do what actual action not feelings not posting a picture of this is how i feel but you know posting a picture of and i know i'm talking a long time I'm like this is how we're supposed to be listening to you and i'm just talking about i feel like a lot of people feel like this this way it's like you know people aren't born racist and blah 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 it's like yes that's nice we're past that now we have to do something about it as adults so what action can we take what should we be doing Ooh, there's so many things <laughs> um well, specific actions, I mean, you'll see it on social media everywhere, is that we need you to sign petitions, we need you to donate, if you're able to donate, um, we need you to educate yourself and your loved ones and really call them out. Um, and that one really, you know, hits home because it's not about me going up to every single person who has, you know, said something wrong to me in specifically having a conversation with them, I shouldn't have to do that every single time someone else should realize, okay, what they said to her was not okay, let me go ahead and educate her, or go ahead and educate that person anyway. Um, and sometimes that's hard with your loved ones, but it's a necessary action to make change. And being loud in that, it's not enough to repost a couple of things. It's not enough to, you know, post a black square for today. You really have to activate and it's exhausting. I'm calling on you guys. I'm calling on everyone to be exhausted because you're black gymnasts, you're black friends, you know, 
the entire black community is exhausted and we've been exhausted for 400 years. So we need you now to be exhausted too until we can make this change. Um, if you're not able to go to protests, you know, go hand out waters at protests or um, circulate information about people that can go to protests, give out food, do every single thing that you can and it's not going to be easy, but we're calling on you guys to be exhausted. And we're going to have a list of resources, including some resources um, that Alexis gave us to include. And I also want people to know that we, as an organization, have donated um, to Colin Kaepernick's um, uh, youth, your Know Your Rights Camp, um, Black Lives Matter bail fund. So people that are going to the protest um, can you know, get out and also the ACLU. And... Um, yeah, that's something that we've done as an organization to to kind of help this along. And, um, you know, I just want to thank you because we have mentioned your protest and your action so many times because it's really it's so incredibly rare and so brave what you did. Um, and I mean, still to this day, like I don't really know of any other gymnasts who have done what you've done. Well, thank you. <laughs> You know, you really made history and it made a difference. And hopefully this time things will change and we won't have to do this every 20 years. One can hope, one can only hope. Um, I did want to talk about COVID for a second in regards to protesting. Um, just that, you know, this is, a re this is really telling the country something that like we are in a global pandemic a hundred thousand people have died and yet still police brutality and racism is more of a threat to our bodies and black people are dying at faster rates than any other race globally from this pandemic and yet you see people you know from london from germany from switzerland or from norway protesting when we're not even out of lockdown still in London, I went to a protest um, a couple of days ago. Everyone was passing out masks to each other and we were trying to evade getting fines because we're not supposed to be out and about still. And there were thousands of people there saying that America, we see you and we do not stand with this. They're protesting too. Yeah. Um, and you are in London uh, because can you tell everybody where you go to school? Because that's kind of a big deal. The Royal Veterinary College. <laughs> it's an amazing program. We were number one in the world um, last year for all veterinary schools. And I'm so grateful to be here. And it was because of UC Davis that, you know, gave me this opportunity also being number one in the world for um, their animal science program. Yeah, world famous animal science program at UC Davis. People don't know. And UC Davis is also crazy hard to get into and a really well respected academic school. So, congratulations on that. Um, one anecdote that I wanted to talk about is I also lived in um, London and did nothing like you did. But when I was there, it was when the Rodney King riots happened. And I remember my, the host family telling me, you know, you're, this is also during the time of apartheid and my, um, the host family said, you know, the United States is exactly like South Africa. And I was so offended. And I was like, no, we're not. And, you know, and it's not like that. And then I learned more. And um, I, you know, learned, like, how very close, even though we didn't have the, the same laws anymore, how the system was built. And I want to recommend um 13th on Netflix is a really good documentary that will help people understand how the whole system has been built to keep segregation in place, um, even though it's not exactly the letter of the law anymore. Um, so that was the reaction of, you know, 20 years ago of or however long, 30, how long ago? I don't even know. It was a long time ago of people in the UK. What is the reaction like now? Like, what do people think of the United States? What reaction do we, they give they you? They are disgusted um but they are also telling me that you know in the uk although it's better generally you know there's still police brutality that happens here it's more covert you don't hear it in the news but there are people dying here too and 
you know, a lot of people are saying that the U.S. learned this from the U.K. It's all started here. So they're not innocent as well. And they're very open in that conversation. And I'm grateful for that. Um, and there's been a lot of conversations also about you're talking about segregation and how the system was built for um, the system was built for racism basically back then. And then they had to overturn it. That's the same thing that people are starting to say now is that it's not about policy reform anymore. We know that that doesn't work. You can't do policy reform on slavery. You can't do policy reform on segregation. You have to abolish the entire system and then build your way back up. And it's not gonna be easy, but that's the only way to make true change because all of this cannot be worth just a couple of steps in the right direction. We can't just see, unfortunately, a pile of black bodies in the pavement anymore. If you want to recommend to another gymnast who wants to do what you have done, what words do you have from them for them? What would you recommend? What advice do you have? And how can we support them? I would say take a long time for reflection in themselves and really see if this is something that they really want to do because there's other ways to make make waves in the community without having to be so um, vocal and visual about it. Because it was really difficult for me mentally um, to go through that. It wasn't any walk in the park. You know, there are multiple days where, I can't even say multiple days, multiple weeks, multiple years, that I was crying through my beam routines because of the opposition that I was met with. So conserve your black voice if you cannot, um, if you know, everyone can contribute in different ways. It doesn't always have to look the same way, but if you can, I would definitely encourage being as vocal as possible because um, that's how you get people to wake up. And I think that in support of these people, um, of these black gymnasts, people can really just ask them, you know, why are you doing this? Can we have a conversation? I want to learn more. Um, you know, really amplify their voice instead of valuing your own opinion on what they're doing. Because if you, if you're white, you don't, you don't have an opinion. You don't have a valid opinion because you have not walked a mile in our shoes. So instead of valuing your own opinion, I need you to listen to mine. Thank you so much. Is there anything else that you want to talk about or cover I, while we have you here? I think I'm good, actually. Okay. Yeah. It was a wonderful conversation, though. I'm so <laughs> glad that you guys are like so open and honest and like really like let my voice be heard. It was really productive, and I'm super grateful to have this opportunity. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you for doing this. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. If you think of anything else you want us to mention or anything, like email me and we'll, we'll totally do it. And yeah, thanks again. Amazing. Thank you. And enjoy that amazing school and amazing city that you're in. Oh, uh, thanks. Hopefully we'll be, you know, out of lockdown soon so I can really uh, take advantage of it here. <laughs> awesome. Stay safe. Take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs> All right, so before we get to that, I want to mention um, Tumble Track, who has been our sponsors from the very beginning and uh, I'm trying to, <sighs> has been with us for a long time and supported us uh, through no matter what we talk about on the show, whether it's social issues, it's supporting um, what we do to support gymnasts. And um, so I want to thank Tumble Track so much, T U M B L T R A K dot com. Um, they have, if you're stuck at home, like you should be. Um, unless you're going to a Black Lives Matter process, then I guess it's okay. But um, other than that, everyone should be at home. Um, you can get whatever you need to work out um, at tumbletrack.com. And they have a, a discount code for 10% off. It's HOME10. They also have a clearance sale going on right now where they have 40% um, off some of their stuff. So um, check it out. And thank you so much to TumbleTrack for supporting us and helping us amplify Black voices Um with our platform. Okay, so let's talk about a roundup of some of the news, some of it we alluded to uh, in the interview with Alexis. So 
the world is still broken. Um, it's this is what I have to say, you guys, because I know this is a it's not an easy time we're going through right now. But think of um, times in history, how things have gotten really awful before they get better. And that is me as a total pessimist. Um, I am. <laughs> you're supposed to. You're, you're claiming you're the pessimist on this podcast. Excuse me. <laughs> that is my. That is my role. <laughs> so, um, I feel like this is the next year is going to be terrible, and things are going to get worse, and then it's going to get better. Like we're going through the very huge storm clouds, and this is what we have to do. Think about it like giving birth horrible painful experience where you're close to death and then magic happens that's how i'm choosing to think about it and i see have you ever seen that like that statue it's like a woman giving birth and there's just like sunshine shooting out of her crotch that's how i'm thinking about this have you seen i'll send it to you guys You'll that is a it. very that is not a pessimistic approach that's a very optimistic approach and because all of us have given birth and we all know well i mean you've heard about it obviously i mean you've watched a video of it at least right Neither of you have. Oh, my yeah, we had to watch. Oh, we we had to mom, watch The Miracle of Life in school. My mom was a childbirth educator. I have been watching birthing videos since I was like three years old. My parents had, um, they filmed it all. So I have seen my own birth. <laughs> in, <laughs> no. Yes, yes. <laughs> Good times. So, Spencer, shall we discuss this week? Yeah. So as we talked about with Alexis, most of the, I mean, I guess the segment is gym internet news because this affects the gymnastics as much as it affects any other part of the world. But um, the nationwide protests against police brutality against Black Americans sparked by the murder of George Floyd and others. Um, and we've seen gymnasts speak out about this. Um, Lori and Simone and Kyla on social media, I think we're the first couple. Thankfully, we've seen more gymnasts speak since then because they do have a voice. They do have, you know, little ones who look up to them and it is important for them to do that. And we have seen a lot of gymnasts um, speak up and some coaches, it's been a little slower. Jessica, you have a roundup. Yeah. So um, some of the first ones that I saw were Stanford and Cal coaches and Cecile Landy, who Cecile's like, on a terror like she's pissed she's she is with you um simone nastia colin van wicklin orosco um who orosco hopefully will be on the show later this week um we're gonna do another i think we're gonna make our behind the scenes um for everybody this week because he's gonna be on and he has a lot to say and um dina leva maggie nichols kim zameskel um another person i saw right away was um auburn's head coach Jeff Graba. Yep. Jeff Graba, mm -hmm. which is really heartfelt what he said. Um, Elise Ray, Stanford, um, Larissa Libby at Iowa, uh, Jay Clark at LSU, you guys, who's known for his very right wing um, Twitter rants, um, also put out a statement, which I think surprised everybody um, who thinks that you can't be on that side of politics, but also see um, racism. So that was good. Amy Borman has spoken out. USA Gymnastics put out a statement, um, Black Lives Matter statement, which was like, what? They've got pride going on. They've got that statement. Um, UCLA, UC Davis, Air Force. USA Gymnastics statement was 15 words long. We debated I mean, whether it was a haiku. I <laughs> wasn't serious when I said and it was a haiku. You, I had what the, do you mean we the... debated, Jessica? We debated I, as in, I, I was like, I don't know <laughs> anything about haikus. Ask Uncle Tim. In the private group text, I may have mentioned <laughs> that USA Gymnastics was trying to write a haiku about Black Lives Matter because of the brevity of their statement. And, and then so, Kensley was like, no, it's 757 seven syllables is a haiku. And no, I was five, like, 575. No. Five. This is why you need a sarcasm, um, sarcasm <laughs> font, you guys. We mentioned this so many times because I was like, I don't know, you guys. That was boring. I skipped that part of paying attention to the school, and it was a joke the whole time. Anyway, that was private, you guys. Okay, so Air Force is also made a statement, which, by the way, Alexis knelt at a meet at, yeah, Air Force. at Air Force. 
she's a total badass also i want to we've talked about her many times on the show but i also want to just give a shout out to the routine podcast which is a college um gymnastics podcast and they were the first place that i learned about her so another shout out to them um air force cal or yeah yale has made a statement and then mark zetta um the most important school of all mark zetta right. fraser <laughs> Mark Fraser University said, don't make me call out other NCAA gymnastics teams. Your silence is loud and clear, sis. I do. Then- I do want to say she just updated and she said, I have reached out to these gyms individually and privately to express my disappointment and their lack of effort. I do not need to call anyone out. You already know who they are. And so do I. Yeah. Did you also see the like someone said, you know, you should call them out and she said they have 24 hours. Yeah. And then after <laughs> she said that, that, all of the teams that hadn't said anything were like, Ugh, you know, piecing together some platitude nonsense. And I was like, Mars has all like I want a TV show called You Have 24 Hours starring Margaret Fraser where she just tells people they have 24 hours to do things and then they do that. <laughs> Like that is that's all I want. That should just be television now. It's the only thing I care about. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Um so the slowest that I noticed, because it took until I mean, some people like Kyla Ross were speaking out last week, um, uh, midweek, and the slowest and I'm let's debate whether slowness matters in cancel culture. Um, you know, the, uh, that I noticed were that, you know, Utah um, came out with something today that the whole team seems to have done together. Oklahoma uh, put something on Twitter. LSU's DD Bro uh, made a statement. Um, and then Georgia, uh, but still, Coupettes has not made a statement. She's the head coach of the Georgia team. Um, and I think that's really important, especially compared to when somebody like Adrian Bird at Florida, um, he made a list on Instagram where he said, um, he listed all of his alumni and current gymnasts, black gymnasts, who were on Instagram or on social media and tagged them. And he said, um, I will stand and work against racism and the harm you, like a personal pledge to them, naming them and like telling them, like, I think it's super important for you to talk personally to your team, like we talked about with Alexis, but also that was like so incredibly heartfelt. And it, he like wanted them to know, wanted everybody to know that he was letting them know. Um, it didn't feel like marketing. A lot of this stuff feels like marketing to me. Um, mm-hmm. And what you guys does yeah, it- like re- retweeting that Nike commercial. I'm like, this is a shoe commercial. <laughs> right. Although it was yeah. a huge deal that like Adidas and Reebok and Nike are all retweeting each other or they're like retweeting Nike. I was like, anyway, they're companies. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, they have some, but it's interesting the- with Florida because we should talk about Kennedy Baker because I think it's relevant that if we talk about a Florida coach doing something like this is what Kennedy Baker said was you know kind of like how my own team asked for my silence when they were saying the racist things to me, calling me racist names. You guys can't put out a statement of support like bare minimum. So we should, you know, I'm I had never heard this from Kennedy before. I'm mm-hmm. sure you know. She owes no one to nothing to anyone. She can talk about it or not talk about it as she wants to, but it is a good, you know, I'm so glad that she said it to us so that we know, because we wouldn't know otherwise. And we support her, obviously. That's the name of this podcast is we support Kennedy Baker. And I did reach out to her. She's one of the first people I asked um, to come onto the show. And it's important to note that she was under two different coaches. So Rhonda Fain was one of her coaches at um, Florida, right? And wasn't her? Yeah, she started with Rhonda. Right. And then Jenny Rowland. And so, you know, we don't know. Or if it was one of the assistant coaches, we don't know who she's talking about specifically. And she hasn't um, said specifically right now. But this it's so important that we listen and that people have the opportunity to, to express how they really feel. And what the hell is going on? Like, this is the whole thing about marketing. Like it makes a bigger impact. I have more respect for Ohio state and what they've done with Paris McGee. That's call me Effie. That's his real name. (laughs) Um, Paris McGee at Ohio state. He is, um, they asked him to come and speak to the whole team. That makes a huge difference. That's more important than having, uh, you know, telling someone to like, oh, don't say anything because we this will affect recruiting. I mean, that's more important than a platitude too. All right, 
way more important for each point in a commercial, as you said. So, but let me talk about cancel culture for a minute. We oh, want, we want change, right? Mm -hmm. We want people to learn. We want people to get it. We want people to understand that just saying, like, I love Bart Connor, but just tweeting a picture of a black and white hand together, that's not going to fix this. That's not it. Um, just loving thy neighbor isn't going to do it. Like, yes, you have to have that in your heart to, like, change how you actually act. This is about police getting away with murder. That's what this is about. Um, how do we get people when you don't agree with them or they're the last team to make a public statement? And we don't know. They might have talked to every single gymnast on the team. They might have had two right. meetings. They might have invited everyone and already had everyone. Like, we don't know that. We're judging from what they put on social media. Yeah. Aren't we supposed to not cancel because we want them to learn and grow and if everybody just, but is outrage, like Alexis said, outrage is the most important thing right now because we tried everything else. Uh, I think outrage is important and also criticism is necessary. Like, Yeah, I think, you know, Jessica, you've talked about so many times that the times that you've grown the most is when people have publicly criticized you um, on social media and it's, it's not a good feeling and it, but it's one of the things that helps kind of turn on on the light um, for some people. You know, when we're dealing with issues of human rights, there is such a mental health aspect to all of it. And so I think for some people, if they need to unfollow someone or they need to not support them anymore because they themselves believe that they're not receiving the support that they believe is due to them, then then that's acceptable. But if someone is in a place where they are able to stand along and educate and stand by someone so we can take someone from, you know, as they grow from racist to realizing they have white privilege to being an ally and being outspoken, that that is a journey and a process. And so if you can stand a light alongside those people, then we have more people working together to be outspoken for the team. Yeah, and I feel like I don't put everything on social media statements. Like, I don't think I've tweeted anything. I mean, I would hope that people who've listened to the show before will know where I stand on this. And I feel like talking about it on Gymcastic is a much more comfortable way of discussing it rather than Twitter. That's just like me personally. That's not, you know, everyone has different mediums where they feel comfortable. But if you're a team, um, especially now when athletes like Kennedy Baker have said, like, it is important for you to say something as a team that has black athletes on your team who don't necessarily feel supported, then you should say something and to be okay. Even though like be okay being criticized and then doing it like that, it's okay to be criticized and then bend to the criticism and do something that you were criticized for doing and doing it late. Like it's okay to have been wrong and then do it. And you know, here's the thing. If, if you are a head coach of an organization, um, particularly of one that's not diverse, and you're finding that your athletes are not speaking up or you're finding that you yourself are not speaking up, it's probably time to evaluate a couple of things. One, uh, the diversity training that's been given to you and to your athletes. Um, I've spoken with some NCAA uh, coaches who after you know, the USA Gymnastics sexual abuse scandal blew up, they completely reevaluated the training that was given to their athletes. So their athletes themselves could become educated and so could they. And, you know, while there may be some grace for a random Jane or Joe, for them not speaking out, you as a head coach, if you are not educated on these topics, if you are not committed to being an ally to those of protected status, you have no business being in that job period. Um, not only because you are a leader, but because it's required under law, you it's it's under Title IX, all protected status, whether it's religion, whether it's sex, whether it's race, it doesn't matter. You are required to protect these people. And you're also like one, I mean, I have to mention like Dom Palangi because, whoa, he's pissed. Um, and he is, uh, yeah. 
he's been at the he had a fantastic by the way he had a fantastic tweet that he deleted and i understand you know why he deleted so i won't repeat it because i don't want to get into trouble but it was so good and i was like mm, i yeah. wish you hadn't deleted it because it's so good <laughs> and he's been out on the streets you know which i'm we're still in a pandemic and i just want to mention like i was kidding earlier about not letting anyone go out because obviously everyone has their own agency and could do whatever they want on this show um but also you know I do like to pressure people into staying not sick, but also I just, you know, I have concerns, but I also kidding. And obviously like my sister went and protested today. She broke her quarantine of almost three months, you know, and me and my sister, we have the same chubby jeans. We are <laughs> at the high risk and like, but I like, if you're going to break quarantine, do it for something like this. That's literally life and death for your fellow citizens, your fellow teammates, your coworkers, people you love, you know, so I'm really proud of her and my niece for doing that. But um, uh, what was I going to say before I got distracted? Um, yeah, Dom is pissed. And one of the things that he said to me was, um, you know, you're not recruiting a black athlete. You're recruiting a black person, a person with a life and a history. And you have to take care of that person as a whole. And that means you have to understand them and what they're, position is and you have to support them um and that really spoke to me um especially because of the way i feel like black athletes are used um to market and sell products and sell programs and um to that end one of the things that i really liked that um greg marsden former head coach at utah said was uh, he tweeted when athletic departments administrators teams and coaches are muzzled by their university or her choose not to actively speak up and speak out against racism, especially now, I can only surmise they are saying racist buy tickets too. That's a absolutely what football program, like athletic departments are saying. I'm sure. Yeah. You can't. It's offend. almost like it's about only about money to them. Right. Like or opening something. back up in the middle of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. You know, what's really interesting is during the, the pandemic, actually, Alabama's governor specifically spoke to the people and said, if you do not follow these orders, we will not have football in Alabama uh, because that's how important, you know, it is. And she framed it as far as COVID. But, you know, cities in Alabama are now having uh, curfews. And, you know, where is where's the governor, the leadership stepping up and saying, if this does not stop, if this police brutality does not stop, we will not have football in the state of Alabama this fall. Yes. 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 Uh, I mean, obviously, I'm going to turn them. this car around and know. <laughs> <football anymore. laughs> OK, that's what and, should happen. In Alabama, football is religion. You have to learn to speak the language of the people. And you know what? As, as, as horrible as that sounds, you have to be able to speak to people where they're at. And that would turn some heads in the state of Alabama. Right. And obviously, we understand that because, like, the most important thing is that everybody quarantine so we can get back to gymnastics. Like, it is my dream to have not a state, <laughs> but a whole country, nay, world, where gymnastics is the most important thing so everyone stays home mm -hmm. so we can have gymnastics so while talking trash about uh football that is also my goal in life um also it's paris mcgee jr and it's call me eiffel not effie on twitter you know what i'm talking about now remember when he I, did i do know who you're talking about i yeah. never know what you're talking about but you know <laughs> we've gotten used to it remember Simone was dating Alec Yoder and she visited them at her, him at Ohio State and then um, and then Paris did her floor routine. And then yes. she retweeted it. Oh, Kensley, this is the important stuff that goes on in men's gymnastics. How do you know about this? Yeah, I need Kensley to learn more about men's gymnastics. Oh my god. Because it's Kensley, like a real it's really like, lacking. Could you take note of all the times that they do women's floor routines? Because that's our favorite thing. Okay. Sure. Speaking of Alabama. We're going to go back to my home state. Good. Like on topic. We're going to get back mm -hmm. on topic. That's good. Yeah. Um, Tia uh, Kiyaku actually just posted uh, this Instagram post talking about a time where she and a few other, um, as she self-described, African-American girls uh, happened to be stuck doing vault drills together and said that ultimately she felt that they were isolated away from the rest of the team and that there were some comments from coaches um, and teammates at the University of Alabama. And so at the end, she kind of had this call to action where she said, 
you know, if the director of athletics and the gym, Alabama gymnastics program really want to take a, a stance on diversity, they need to be transparent and they need to like look at themselves and what's actually happening in their program. And she left the team, correct? I'm, yeah. I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, she says it in the post. After much consideration, uh, I decided to walk away from the team and the university. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, the, and the, what does this tell you that it has taken a worldwide movement mm-hmm. for these athletes to feel comfortable coming out publicly about this? I mean, that that's how it's been with every human rights issue to my knowledge if it's dealing with um women and the sexual abuse and harassment that they face you know it it takes a big explosion um for people to feel comfortable uh for the lgbtq uh, plus community um it really took awareness that people in that community were were dying and and feeling pressured into into suicide before people started waking up and saying oh my gosh like we cannot treat these people as as less than they are human beings and they deserve to be treated as such and riots the stonewall riots riots yeah riots riots work you guys i'm not saying you know i'm all for riots but also like if you don't want there to be riots maybe you should have paid attention to kaepernick when he was trying mm-hmm. to peacefully tell you what was happening Piss me off. and don't equate uh like spray painting a building with killing someone those are right. not equal <laughs> things murder slow i mean let's talk about like you know what happened to george ford go ahead no i was gonna talk you you go slow intentional murder while looking into a video camera in front of many people knowing you're being filmed that's what we're talking about that's how serious this is yeah what is it i was gonna talk about yeah what does it tell you about the system when when you can look into a camera and be like what Oh, you can't do anything about this. Nope. Nope. Mm-hmm. I'm going to kill this guy. Can you imagine? And the st- I was going to talk about the statement from Pence that was like, we don't condone violence against property or persons. And I'm like, did you just put par- property first? Um, also, Jesus turned over a table in the tabernacle. And for someone who self-proclaims to be like a Jesus-loving, Bible-believing Christian, like he should know that. And that sometimes it takes a riot and some movement before things actually happen. Kensley, I love that you can cite the receipts. So uh, that makes me very happy. The receipts. I don't know what that sentence meant, but it sounded like <laughs> he threw a drink. Right? It sounded Bible-y. You said that tabernacle. Jesus was like, mm, drink in the face. So, um, so I want to recommend cocktail in the camera. That's what happened. So I want to recommend some resources that really spoke to me. Um, I think I've talked about before about reading... Um, uh, Malcolm X, the the autobiography of Malcolm X in high school, um, and then seventy. There's an article on Medium called seventy five, and we'll put it in the the link. Seventy five things white people can do for racial justice. That is something like there's actual actions in addition to this resource list that we'll give. Um, the movie Do the Right Thing. Ugh, that that movie depicts exactly what we see on video all the time now, and um, that was made thirty years ago. Um, the 13th on Netflix again um I want to recommend and Kensley please hold me accountable now well and that's you know that's what I want to talk about is within ourselves so at the beginning of the podcast you talked about things that Jim Castic as a whole has done for the movement so I want to talk about some things that uh, we individually um have done because i I think I can speak for all three of us that we are committed to learning more about our biases that we are committed to do the hard work Uh, to change any that we find. We are committed allies um, and we are committed to learning uh, through our mistakes. And so some of the things that um, I've taken and done is donated um, to the Black Lives Matter Fund. Um, I bought the book, um, So You Want to Talk About Race. Um, I have uh, saved, there's a page, the Harvard page that you can identify your biases, whether it's by race, by gender, uh, by people who are overweight. Um, so I am working through taking those um, so that I can learn um, biases that I have in my own heart and, and and find the resources so that that I can become an ally in all of those areas. What one about of the y'all? things I was, well, one of the things I was thinking about, because I was thinking about like, what have we, like, what can I do better? And 
like gymnastic specific things. Um, cause this is, you know, they talk, you know, in your community. It's not like I, I'm like, whenever the, 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 like the list of things you can do is like, talk to people in your community. I'm like, talk community. Spencer's the gym, <laughs> gymnastics <talks> hermit. <laughs> who talks to their neighbors. So I'm like, what's my community? My gymnastics. And not that long ago, I was talking to a former Brevet judge who said, made a comment like, oh, well, racial bias doesn't exist in gymnastics judging. Like, that's not a thing. We don't have that problem. And so, and my reaction in my head was, this is bullshit. That's obviously wrong. That's like, if you say we don't have racial bias in fill in the blank, that is incorrect. Um, but I didn't say anything in the interest of you know, it's a c calm social environment, I guess, in the interest of quote unquote, not getting into it or preserving the peace. And that's something I look at and like, you know, you should have said something because that was an opportunity to disabuse this per person of their obliviousness to problems that we have in our own gymnastics community. And so that's the kind of thing I look at like, okay, you know, I think it's helpful to look back on previous things. This is why I always make fun of NCAA teams who are like, our slogan this year is no regrets. I'm like, no, you should have regrets. Everyone should have regrets because that's how you learn from the things you did before. And you think about them and you worry about them as you're falling asleep instead of falling asleep. And then you do it better the next time. Yeah. So Isn't those that that's the kind slogan? of thing. I All regrets, nothing in. Yeah, you should always have you should always have regrets of past experiences because they weren't perfect, and you should think about what those regrets are so you don't do them again. You know, <sighs> Spencer. So you know, you talked about a former judge um, saying there weren't biases, and we actually have the top judge of judge who spoke out this week. Um, Jessica, did you actually see um, Steve Butcher's post on Amy Borman's uh, Facebook wall? Yes. So um, I think, do you want to read this story? Because um, I actually, I was kind of like, should we mention this or not? Because I don't have permission for him. But then I, you know, was like. Well, he posted it publicly. It was, it was it's a public, it yeah, it's yeah. on a public so. post. I think someone else should read it so that it doesn't, um, so that it's not actually like butchered. Like, uh, okay, uh, 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 and his name is Steve Butcher. I got it. Okay. Uh, so background for people who don't know, uh, Steve Butcher works and lives in Switzerland as part of the FIG. He's um, part of the technical men's technical committee, and he's also um, a level one brevet judge. So he uh, said at the 1996 Olympic trials, I was there as a men's gymnastics judge. About 15 judges rode the bus on the first night of competition from the hotel to the Boston arena. It was exciting because we had a police motorcycle escort with sirens to help us get through the heavy traffic that evening. When we got to the arena, the bus and the escorts pulled into the arena tunnel and then the motorcycle cops left. All of the judges got off the bus except out of the bus and I was the last one. I was the youngest of the group, but one of the head judges. I used to ride the bus to study a bit uh, before arriving. And when I stepped out of the bus, I could feel people running towards me. And it was three policemen. They aggressively asked to see my credential or accreditation and started grabbing for it inside my jacket. I took a step back and started yelling at them. What the hell are you doing? You never asked any of the other guys to see their credentials. I knew exactly what was going on because there are, I've been there so many times before. They started threatening me. We will escort you out of the building. We can arrest you. I said, you can do whatever you want, but after I write down your names and badge numbers. So I pulled out my judge's pad and I started writing. Two of my fellow judges returned to see what happened to me. In the end, the cops backed off. I was shaken, embarrassed, and angry. What a way to begin a night of judging. Clearly being the only minority judge had its consequences. Keep in mind that all judges were all wearing the same type of uniform and we had already had a police escort to the arena. That incident still affects me today. From time to time, even at events, security or police feel the need to touch my credential and no one else's. It brings me back to that day almost 25 years ago. I usually show them my displeasure and sometimes yank it out of their hands. This is only one incident that has shaped my life. I don't necessarily call it racism, but it clearly is some high level BS bias, maybe even unconscious at times. The head officer in Boston came to me just before the competition to apologize. He did it out of fear that I would report their stupidity or even share it with the media. I mentioned the possibility of doing both. I accepted the apology and told him all this type of treatment was unacceptable racial profiling and the aggressive attitude of the officers involved showed poor training. 
hashtag judging while black. Man, I mean, this story, first of all, I was like, I always wonder, I mean, I think this is why it's such a big deal that we have somebody like Steve Butcher um, in charge at the FIG now, because the FIG has been a white run, white, 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 white male place for forever. Um, and then we had Nellie Kim break into the top ranks and Steve Butcher, which makes a huge difference. And, um, you know, how many other minority judges, I wonder how the Muslim judges are treated, um, especially, you know, the wear hijab. And this also made me think, has Tom Forrester said anything? He is happy to post a bunch of pictures talking about great coaches with pictures of Maggie uh, Haney. Has, have we heard about anything that he's posted on Facebook about Black Lives Matter now? I, I don't know, but I wouldn't know. I'm, yeah. I'm not on Facebook with him, but I haven't, I haven't seen anything make the rounds. Mm. Tom Forrester. You're one of those coaches we expect to hear from. Um, also, going back to bias, um, this is another, I mean, I just want to revisit the scoring bias that Spencer was just talking about. Um, and this goes into, like, having, you, there shouldn't be an entire panel of white people judging the world doing gymnastics. You have to have diversity in your judging panels. And, um, like, I feel like score for score and Spencer should team up and do a analysis of, um, of bias judging in uh, NCAA gymnastics, maybe. FIG might have more. <laughs> score yeah. for score is um, like... But one of the things, like, on racial bias in judging, I was thinking about, like, you can say, I could say, you know, obviously there is, because gestures and everything, the world, but there's not actually evidence that you can point to because no one's ever done the study. You can't say, I know that because of this, this, and this. Because we we don't have that. You know, the FIG does a lot to, um, as Jessica talks about all the time, they have measures of bias, but not of you know, racial or body type bias. It's like national bias. So right. we don't have evidence to point to. And so yes. let's make some evidence. I don't mean like cook the books, like make up some <laughs> evidence. I mean, like, let's do Let's have a study. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> let's make some evidence, Spencer, <laughs> you know, committing crimes as usual. I mean, if the police are doing it. Um, so uh, thinking back to like what, Steve Butcher posted and sharing his story, which is also another thing. Like he said, that's the first time that he has told this story publicly again, like someone else who didn't feel safe to share what their mm -hmm. experience is in until it, there's riots and a worldwide movement. And this is again, we're reminded of Mary Bono, the shortest lived president of USA gymnastics ever. What was it like 24 hours? The worst choice ever for for usag president and her um post about kaepernick taking a knee um and that <clears> is what you know and how she wouldn't wear nike because they supported kaepernick and you know that's another reason why this was not she was not an acceptable choice for this position period end of story disgusting go away like uh, mm -hmm. i know that i'm not supposed to cancel her and i want her to learn from her mistakes and da, 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 but she did not so Anyway, well, she can learn, but not in that position. Mm. Yeah, another thing I had been thinking about recently was in terms of the gymnastics community is, and this is everywhere, but like the immediate defensiveness that comes. Like we have, you know, in any time a black athlete talks about a negative experience, like the um, stories about Gabby Douglas at Excalibur, when she talked about, um, feeling isolated and other teammates making comments and then the immediate swarming of all the Excalibur people to be like, no, that's not what happened. We loved her. We gave her rides. I was like, that's, it's not what we're, it's not, it's, um, that's not what we're talking about. And it is immediate, like, you know, reject the immediate need to be defensive. Well, like, you know, she talked about, um, or I think maybe her mom talked about after she won the Olympic gold medal, the people commenting on her hair and yeah, that was a big, yeah, it was, it was a huge deal. And I've had friends personally tell me that they feel like, um, they're not able to wear their hair naturally, uh, because they get, they feel like there is more criticism and more, they feel personally that they endure, 
um, more acts of racism uh, when their hair isn't um, it hasn't been done with like the sleek um, shiny look. So I'm not up to terms on that, but I, Gabby specifically talked about experiencing this. Well, you know, on the podium, she just won the gold medal. She had accomplished everything she wanted. And then people are talking about her hair. And this is a, a good point, like that you bring up with um, with Gabby and uh, Uncle Tim made a post where he pulled out the parts of Lewis Smith, um, Gabby Douglas and Simone's autobiographies where they talk about the racism they have experienced. And Lewis was specifically talked about how when he wore his hair natural, um, a a teacher thought he was wearing a wig and went to pull his hair at school. Like um, tried to yank it off because he thought yank it, was it off a wig. his head. They thought he was wearing a wig. Um, like, and the thing is, like, when we talk about white privilege, and you know, Coop was reminding me of this, is if you don't understand what white privilege is, and I, I think a lot of people are just offended by privilege. Like, I work for everything I have. No, we're talking about you getting a head start without doing anything to earn your head start, and that head start is and is like. If you read Nastia's autobiography and Sean Johnson's autobiography and all these white gymnasts, they don't talk about racism. They don't talk about what they had to change in their lives because they were discriminated <clears throat> against. Um, and that is white privilege. And this is the difference about recognizing what is different um, for black athletes. Yeah, I, I wanna talk a little bit about um, the silence that you just referred to. And I want to refer back to what um, Alexa said at the um, at the beginning of of the podcast, where she said, um, "You, we need to people need to listen to what we are saying now, uh, and and to know how to speak up." And so, for some who are being silent, it is pure and utter evil. It's refusing to speak so that they can keep the status quo unchanged, so that they can keep their privilege as is. Um, but for some, the silence is simply a light bulb moment. And Spencer, you talked about um, what we can do within our own community. And as I've spoken about several times, I grew up in a very, very small town in Alabama. The town where my parents live has one stoplight in the whole town. Um, it's 95% white. I looked up the statistics. Um, everyone at my church was white. Everyone in my high school was white. Um, and that creates a culture, almost a cult-like culture. And until you've lived that, it's that also is hard to understand. And so I was able to grow and I met people who challenged uh, my own ideals uh, and what I thought was good. And I had safe people like Jessica to talk to, to say, you know, how do you see this certain issue? And was it was able to grow to a point where I feel like I'm able to be an ally. Uh, but some of my family were not to that point. And for years, I had tried to explain to them that what Kaepernick was doing was, in fact, um, not anti-constitutional. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he was not coming after the United States of America. And, um, and they didn't get it. They really didn't get it. And it wasn't until they saw the picture side by side of Kaepernick and um, uh, George being uh, murdered that they they realized, oh my gosh, like we have a bias. Racism is still real. And so they've been asking for resources and they've been asking questions. And uh, so that's part of the that's part of the learning process. And so some, for some people who are being silent, it is the first time that they are not siding with the oppression. It's the first time that they are not themselves being racist. And it's the first time that they are accepting new vocabulary like white privilege because they were in complete denial that ex it uh, existed before. And, you know, it would be wonderful if everyone was perfectly educated on and how to be an ally on all issues, on how to be an ally for women, on how to be an ally against harassment, on how to be an ally for LGBTQ+, on how to be an ally um, for Black Lives Matters. But the fact is that, that we're all people from different walks of life. And um, I want to encourage people, uh, those of you who are criticizing, criticizing people for posting a black square or for using the wrong hashtag, it may potentially be counterproductive to the cause because that's the first time that someone has taken any step to step out. And the way that you build those people who are able to be allies is by challenging them and by calling them out, but also um, helping them by giving them resources as well. So, 
Yeah, no, I think that's really, I mean, I think it's one of the things that I've really learned in part of this, being part of the podcast is um, my reaction. Like, I am the person at, and this has happened many times, um, Coop can attest, I am the person at Thanksgiving dinner that if you say something racist, I will bring it up and call you out and not do it gently. No <laughs> listener is surprised by this information at all. <laughs> It's yeah, the least um, surprising thing anyone's ever said. Right, exactly. And uh, I have done that. And, um, you know, it puts people on the defensive immediately. It shames them. It puts them on the defensive. It shuts them down. And I get really angry. So I'm really happy to see when people get put in their place and are shut down. And that works for me. Um, that has changed me, as Kensley said before, being part of the podcast. Like, when I have been totally shamed and called out on social media has been some of the times that I've had the most growth in my life. That's also been the times that I'm like, man, I want to lash out and then I have to go cry and then I have to talk to Coop about it and then I have to check in with my people and then I call my mom. And then I can be like, okay, let me take a minute. And yet sometimes I lash out and then I have to delete my tweets. Um, thank God you can delete tweets. I mean, editing would be great too, but um, it's, that doesn't work for everybody. You have to be able to take your ego out of it and learn. And so I know we need all kinds of people. And so we need people like me, obviously, clearly. But um, we also need... <laughs> <Duh>. <laughs> but we also need people who can, like, gently nudge and try to explain in a neutral way without saying, like, you're a horrible racist and here's why. People can just say, here's something to consider. Um, and that makes a huge difference. Um, so How about those of us who only have the ability to express ourselves via GIFs? That's also totally works. Because okay, thank humor you. Humor is extremely important in social change. Hello, like you guys, have you? I mean, I don't usually watch TV news because I find it horrible, but I watch it when there's something going on. And so I've been watching um, TV news a lot this past week. And I'm just like, how does anybody know what's going on? I would have no idea what's going on if I watch TV news. It's so terrible. I was like, if without Twitter, I would have no idea what's happening in the world. It's. And then I'm like, well, no wonder people don't know what's going on. If you only watch your local NBC news station, I mean, the, the amount of reporting that was incorrect, people are showing solidarity with George Floyd. I was like, no, they're not. They're protesting his murder. This is about police brutality. They're not like, we love him. He was a great guy. This is about, this is against something. It's against murder. Anyway, I can't mm -hmm. remember what I got. On there are, th you know, two things that have made life worth living um that one news clip uh where the news anchors thought it was someone was carrying a cinder block and they were carrying the that one of those cat scratching things have you seen that one uh, it's so good they're like oh and th this protester has a cinder block uh oh and it's one of those like two tier cat houses that they could scratch <laughs> that was amazing <laughs> Also, the video of those idiots in West Hollywood who tried the one who tried to kick the protester and missed and fell over backward. I've watched that like 35 times. It's the only it's like, you know, when bad things happen to bad people, sometimes you're entertained by that. And that's I been mean, helping me. I also <laughs> sent you some really good rolling dumpster fire videos. Yes. For, we've yes. gotten so many great dumpster fire videos um, for gift making purposes because those yeah. are always going to come in handy because gymnastics. <laughs> I also just want to speak to before we get to this next part like I know a lot of people are like I don't know what to do like and I don't want to do the wrong thing and so you're paralyzed because you don't know what to do like you don't want to be someone who just constantly puts their foot in their mouth like I do so I can understand that um there are, there uh, are people on Twitter famous for putting their foot in their mouth over and over yes someone has been really quiet I was surprised. As of, as of late. Yeah. So maybe learning things. Um, we're talking about Jonathan Horton, obviously. <laughs> uh, I don't know why we can just say that. Like, <laughs> just like, uh, what? I'm just saying, like, this is someone that we, I mean, I think, you know, we feel like is someone that can be nudged given the right, like, has potential to get there, but doesn't get it yet, you know? And so this is like, we're trying not to, we're trying to help you not be canceled. So if you could, you know, <laughs> nudge along, on. nudge along, come on. Um, yeah. So 
I you're understand. Not- yeah, people not kind of feeling paralyzed and not knowing what to do, and also feeling you don't want to do the wrong thing. Like I, I've just criticized Bart Connor. Like, what kind of human am I? Um, but I'm, I am criticizing, critiquing, as Spencer pointed out earlier, in an effort to say, you know, this is a beautiful, beautiful sentiment, but we don't need sentiment right now. We need action, and so that's where we're going to share this and so many people have shared the black lives matter card where you can pick what you want to do you can sign a petition you can call you can donate what level if you don't know what to say donate if you don't know you know there's a lot of things that you can do and Mm -hmm. the other thing you can do is like today is about elevating black voices like amplifying that like um you can do that and that's what we've been doing this whole since last friday on social media like we have only been reposting what um black athletes have done or people that are important to the organization like making sure that people see what's happening um and and also yeah so that's i guess kind of what i recommend like find something that speaks to you and do that i think you also have to know that being an advocate of anything um means accepting that you're going to make mistakes um so i'm not part of the lgbtq plus community. And I have certainly said things um, that I are... embrace you as an ally, Kensley. <laughs> Thank you. But you know, that are, that are counterproductive. And for those of us who are not black, I can almost guarantee that we are going to stick our foot in our mouth, or we are going to say things that are counterproductive. And we have at least be... four times on this podcast, <laughs> we have to be willing um, to learn. And that's, that is that is part of being an advocate and, and being an ally. It, it just, it is. And part of that is like, if you're somebody who doesn't know what to say at all right now, you can say, if you feel the need to say something on social media, you know, you can say, I, um, I don't know what to do. I support you. And I'm going to look for ways to support you. Um, yeah. Um, in that manner, <laughs> being an ally and an advocate is a marathon. Um, it's not, uh, you know, usually after there's something blows up on social media or in the news, there's this huge push and there's, you know, there's Black Lives Matter is very um, heavy right now. And it's almost popular in a way to be a part of this movement. But if you want to see real change, that means running the race like long time. It means keeping people accountable. It means having those hard discussions with your family members. And so as part of that, I wanted to make people aware of something called um, compassion fatigue. And it's something, uh, it's a research idea that was developed in the early 1990s as a response to uh, nurses working in the ER on um, the empathizing and being compassionate with their patients ultimately led to fatigue and burnout of them being able to care for others. And they have found that this can also happen um, when you're joining a movement. And there's a really great book called Compassion Fatigue, How the Media uh, Sells Disease, Famine, War, and Death. And right now we're dealing with a lot of war and famine and disease and death. And uh, part of how the media makes its money is sensationalizing um, things or just focusing on um, aspects that are all bad because more people watch when things are all bad. And well, it's also not news when people are doing the right thing and doing their job. Uh, uh, yeah, totally agree. I didn't mean that <laughs> to sound as a bad I'm statement. I'm not taking it personally. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I want to make people aware that as you try and become more informed on, on the many issues that are happening in our world right now, be aware that it's likely that you may get become fatigued and it is okay to, to self-care and recoup. And then go right back into battle as you are able, because this this is not a five day post George Floyd war. This is we have a long way to go. Uh, so just be look up compassion fatigue, be aware of it, um, and learn learn how your media consumption uh, can affect that within yourself. One other thing I want to talk about today is the IOC's Rule Fifty, mm-hmm. which is still a thing that exists, Mm-mm. and it states that. No kind of demonstration or political, religious, or racial propaganda is per- racial propaganda is permitted in any Olympic sites, venues, or other areas. So, um, stop that, IOC. And racial also, propaganda. That's the la- even the language. I'm like, 
Jessica, you're muted, by the way. But um, yeah. I was letting you talk. I saw you rage. I could see Jessica raging in silence. And I was like, <laughs> we need the volume here. <laughs> I mean, and the USOC still has this rule that you're not allowed to protest. Um, if you're an athlete in the United States and you're representing the U.S. at the, at the Pan American Games or at the Olympics, you can't protest. And th there is there are athletes who have knelt most recently at the Pan Am Games. Pan Am there were mm -hmm. two fencers fencing um one or two who kneeled and they're on probation now and um what does it say that it's more important to not to show not to demonstrate for human rights and against murder um that's the priority of the usoc could could usag make a separate clause to say at their nationals that they will allow kneeling etc or is it because they're part of the usoc they can't do that um as far as i know if it is not an assignment you so at nationals you could because you represent your own team but as soon as you wear usag leotard you're representing usag then um mm. you can't do it but you but know that was the thing but only at a only at a Pan Am Games or Olympics. So I don't know what USA Gymnastics rules are at World Championships or at Yazolo or, you know, at one of the World Cups. World you Cup, know, if it's a qualifier, that has, to, that has to count. You know, but USA Gymnastics has said that they support Black Lives Matter and maybe a way that they can actually take action because we've been calling mm. them to action for a long time is for them to publicly say, if you feel like there is an injustice, you know, against women or harassment against black lives, you have the ability to stand or kneel on the podium as you feel free to do, you know, or they could e even if they're not allowed to by the USOC, what if they said uh, any fines you might face from the USOC, USA Gymnastics will pay them. Spencer, wouldn't idea. that be something like something actually good, like a good idea statement that USAG could do? I mean, how much time do you spend talking about the USAG and the USOC talking about giving athletes a voice? It's all we say on this podcast ever, but there are rules that specifically say, oh, no, that voice, you don't have it. That's so a great idea. Or also say, like, we'll pay your legal fees. Like, right. Or anything. Yeah. Anything like that. Right. Uh, I mean, of course, it's USAG, so they'd have to go to bankruptcy court to get permission to say that they could, because it's such a garbage fire. But you know, the the idea is. But you know, we we have we have noted the changes that Lily and her staff are implementing, and I think they have been good. But we need to see more, and putting that back in the hands of the athletes, allowing them to have the final say would speak volumes yeah like we support you what and and like lily has said i we need the athletes to feel comfortable speaking up um and that's how we need change and obviously like you can't you shouldn't depend on them to speak up because you need to put they are fear of retaliation and they don't have the power and blah, all that all those problems but like um you know if they want to rip the usag logo off and like burn it while they're on the podium because of all the things that have happened. Like, Jessica's I... doing a note, writing notes to Simone right now. Just I like mean, ideas. These are just suggestions. I mean, so. if you want to do that while kneeling and holding that in the air too, like that, oh. you know, would definitely make a statement. Oh my God, it would be so great. But, um, you know, whatever you feel is fine. I mean, I don't want to tell you what to do, all the gymnasts, but, um, <laughs> Yeah, that would be amazing if they were like, no, they, I mean, that's putting your money where your mouth is. If you're like, no, we support her right. Like we just had a little like tiny fire extinguisher standing by to help her afterwards. But, you know, oh my God, you guys. Um, speaking of which, uh, speaking of things that you're told not to do, uh, we're going to have John Roscoe on later this week um have we been told not to do that <laughs> no john roscoe has been told to like oh but john okay. roscoe has a lot to say he has a lot to say and we've been waiting a long time for him to be totally ready to say the things all the things like and there's things that we have not been able to talk about because people haven't been willing to come forward um especially about the 2012 olympics and all the things that went on at olympic trials and behind the scenes at the 2012 olympics um and how black athletes are treated and non-white athletes are treated and um so he's going to be on this week 
and we've been waiting for this for a really long time. And um, he's also going to talk about, you know, Black Lives Matter. And um, he's had a lot to say um, on social media this week. So if you're a Club Gym Nerd member, we'll have that out for you right away. I think we're going to put that out for everybody because it's one of those things that's really important and everyone needs to be able to hear what he has to say. Um, but it'll go to Club Gym Nerd members first. And, um, and that'll be on Friday sometime. We'll have that up. Um, and back to accountability. Um, because we've talked about, I mean, Alexis asked, asked us to activate. I love that word, activate. Um, you know, and I felt it's like... fulfilling whole, Jessica's dream of being a transformer. Exactly! Like, superhero. And, like, oh, this whole, you know, past week, I felt like I'm not doing anything. I'm not protesting. I'm like, I've protested many times in my life, as I'm sure you guys can imagine. Um, which, those are more stories for behind the scenes. Um, all the wonderful encounters I've had with police. But um, I... I had to remind myself like, oh, I do a podcast every single week where I talk about social issues and gymnastics, like get people to care about things through their sport. You know, like if you want Alabama football, wear a mask, you know, if you want gymnastics to come back, like mm -hmm. this is kind of an avenue to get people to care. If um, you want Alabama to gymnastics to exist, support Tia Kiyaku very clearly. <laughs> Um, so I just wanted to say that to do what Alex has asked us to do and honor her interview with us and her taking the time, like being up in the middle of the night in London, um, to talk to us here. Um, I, I posted this, that article, the 75 things that white people can do for, um, for social justice. And, um, me and my sister have committed to each other that we are going to hold each other accountable to do one thing every day. So she voted today and protested today, um, by the way, in Pennsylvania, no signs about where to vote, nothing directing you to where to vote, and no social distancing, nothing to prevent COVID when she voted. So just, you know, it's perfectly fine. Everything's fine. Um, but the things that I have done, because Kensley asked me, put it in the notes, what have you done on this list? So I Googled if my county and city police are required to wear body cams. So I looked that up, and yes, they are, but, like, it doesn't say, like, where the video goes to and, like, is it uploaded to the cloud so that it's always immediately uploaded? And like the minute that you put your thing on, it starts videotaping. So you can't lose it or forget to turn it on, which is something that's been happening um, in a lot of these protests. And then I forget also, to turn it on. I forgot. I forgot Ooh, right when I shot that Oops. guy. Oops. Oops. Um, and I also want to say like, to not be like crapping on, you know, it's not like we're just all the, the police officers that are, that are murdering people in cold blood without remorse may put all other police officers in danger and i think that's why we see so many police officers mm -hmm. kneeling in support because they're like yeah that we don't want anybody like that uh, around us so anyway i also did bystander training with um so it's bystander intervention tra intervention trainings um by hollerback it's ihollaback.org which i think is hilarious because you know the origins <laughs> of hollaback it's like <laughs> Holla back if you want to hook up and Netflix and chill with me tonight is what that means. It's about sex. So anyway, that's cute that they called it holla back, but it's iHollaback.org. And um, I did, like, if you see racism happening, how can you intervene? Um, and it was super helpful. And I realized I'd actually seen people do it before, but I didn't know this is what they were doing, like following specific steps. So that was really helpful. Um, so those are the two things I've done so far, Kensley, and I will report back at least one thing that I've done each week to do what Alexis has asked for and what she put. She went through so much and everyone is all like black people around the world are have been fighting and um, trying to get us to get it for 400 years. And so the least I can do is one thing per week um, to help this cause and to help change things. Um, and Spencer, don't forget about that study you're going to do with. <laughs> I will not forget about that. Score for score. I rarely forget about studies. They're my <laughs> one of my favorite things. I just want a spreadsheet. I mean, what <sighs> if we actually discovered that black athletes across the board for the last whatever amount of years are not have not scored as well? I mean, if there's a trend. Could we tell? Could we? I mean, I, there's so. I know. Many I know. I don't know how you would tell. I would not I be surprised at all and if that's the case. You would, you would have to find a panel that 
has very little to no biases to be able to yeah. compare their judging against their. And then you also have to find the judges who are up to date on those codes on in which the. I mean, it could be done, but it's 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 very multi layered. Yeah, Kensley is taking this to a real place, and it's <laughs> making it harder. Chart. I just want a chart that's like white scores, black scores. Yeah. Well, I do. I am getting a degree in performing arts health. So I research, you know, the health of performing artists, which I would loop gymnasts into that. So, I mean, maybe there should be a study and like this should be funded and the FIG and the NCAA uh, coaches committee should really be into this. Um, so thank you so much to Alexis Brown for joining us this week. And um, thank you to everyone who is trying to make a difference and make the world better and um please stay safe everybody wear your masks uh our masks have not arrived yet but i am so excited to see spencer in his mask i tried to get him a pommel mask but he said he wouldn't wear it so, well i wouldn't I, wear that out of the outside. house i did find i did find that one mask that was the grinch on it and it said ooh people and i just like felt that that was the most perfect one for spencer it's in the group chat is it what yeah Okay. I, we have a group sorry. chat. Jessica, what do we text on all day? Oh, yeah, our text <laughs> messages. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. We, we hit the. the we hit yeah. our. We've, we're cooked. It's after. We've been on for an hour and a half now. So we're done. All right. So. Um, Check out the resources list that we put up this week. And thank you so much for listening. We'll see you back here with John Orozco on Friday. Um, thank you especially to Club Gymnard members and for our to our sponsors for supporting us, Tumble Track, Norberts. Um, and uh, we will see you guys on Friday. Until then, please remember, you are beautiful. You are lovely. Yeah. Go out there and enjoy this. <laughs> Stay